It's the Rob Carson Show. Are you ready to be pod smacked? Now, here's Rob Carson. Hello, everyone. How are you? Uh, welcome to episode number 181 of the Carson Show podcast. It is available on a variety of outlets, including the Podcast Radio Network. Podcast Radio Network every day at uh, 5 p.m. Central Standard Time, of course, on Liberty One TV, 4 o'clock Central Standard Time, and uh, and all over the web, like I said, uh, YouTube, uh, iTunes, iHeartRadio, and whatnot. Uh, glad to have you guys with me today. Today is the 5th of October, 2017. The month of my birth, thank you very much, and also the month of my wife's birth right now, Libra. And I am a uh, Scorpio cusp, so those uh, in in uh, October who have birthdays, happy birthday, okay? Uh, a lot of stuff to get to with regard to Vegas, uh, a lot of audio as as usual. Uh, the podcast will be getting longer because I'm, I'm enjoying this so much, and I, and I hope you are as well. Uh, so, and by the way, if you'd like to write me personally, if you watch the podcast, if you listen to the podcast, Carson on the radio at gmail.com. I'm also on Facebook at Rob Carson show and on Twitter at Rob Carson. Okay. Uh, the latest from Vegas, uh, the killer who will remain unnamed had apparently booked two hotel rooms overlooking Lollapalooza in Chicago this summer. Uh, talking about my generation, right? Lollapalooza festival. It's like our, our uh, Woodstock, but they do it annually. Uh, he had booked rooms at the Blackstone Hotel, which showed a guest list, had him on there for August the 1st and 2nd, uh, and a second on, on the 3rd. Uh, Lollapalooza began on the 3rd. Both rooms had a checkout date of August 6th when the festival ended. Paddock specifically requested both rooms to have a sweeping view of Grant Park about 500 yards away. Never showed up for it, though. Among the 400,000 people who packed into the, uh, the Windy City was Malia Obama. She might have been there. Who knows? And uh, the Blackstone directly overlooked the main stage and several adjoining stages at Lollapalooza. Uh, Chicago, probably harder to get guns into. Probably harder to land at the airport with this amount of guns or drive in with it. Possibly get them into the hotel. I don't know. Paddock had also tried to uh, rent rooms at the Ogden, a luxury condo tower to overlook the Life is Beautiful festival held in downtown Vegas, September 22nd through the 24th. So the son of a bitch wanted to do, uh, he wanted to off a bunch of people regardless, and this was just the, the place that he ended up doing it. Unbelievable. He uh, gambled up to $100,000 an hour in video poker with a constant stream of booze. Played 1,000 hands of video poker in a single hour at a cost of $100,000. He bet colossal, uh, colossal sums by playing $125 a time hands at uh, ferocious speed for eight hours in casinos on the Strip and in Reno. He had uh, been seen at exclusive VIP tournaments in Vegas where he won uh, and lost six-figure sums. The players described him as a low-level high roller, but he still would get uh, a lot of perks, including free limousine rides, $10,000 worth of free money to play with. His girlfriend was taken on all expenses paid shopping trips, and they would have stayed in expensive hotel suites for free. Apparently, uh, other high rollers were concerned about Paddock. I said his name, damn it. Uh, drinking a constant stream of booze while he was playing. He was a heavy, heavy drinker, and they wondered if his high alcohol in intake could have contributed to his uh, mental deterioration. He, he had a, uh, a fortune worth about $2 million through his real estate business, but uh, apparently he was kind of a, a, a semi-high roller. Another thing about this guy, uh, apparently he targeted aviation fuel tanks at the airport in Vegas, not too far from the Mandalay Bay Casino, law enforcement found uh, bullet pox, not holes, there were pox in aviation tanks across the street from the festival. He was trying to trigger an explosion. Uh, construction crews are currently patching up and painting over the holes, and the FBI inspected the tanks and measured how far they had been from uh, Paddock's gun nest. Apparently, there was no way this could have penetrated the tanks, first and foremost. And second of all, uh, airplane fuel, jet fuel, is essentially kerosene. If you dropped a match in a, uh, a vat of kerosene, it would probably just go out. So it wouldn't have worked. It wouldn't have worked. Uh, that's what I know about kerosene. But these apparently at airports, these tanks are girded for such an event. And so he was unsuccessful at doing that. Just a sick bastard, right? I mean, who who thinks like this? Who thinks like this? And And again, we may never know, guys. We may never know. His girlfriend is back in the States. She's being questioned. I've got some audio coming up from an expert who uh, 
I guess, knows a few things about terror, uh, knows a few things about um, the mentality and says this guy was not a terrorist. He was not uh, associated, and, and Alex Jones will tell you otherwise, but uh, he was not associated with ISIS. Um, he was uh, just a nutcase. So, like I said, I don't know if, if we will ever know what happened, why he did it. But uh, the sheriff in Vegas, Clark County Sheriff Joseph Lombardo, was an impressive person. I'm just impressed with all of the, uh, the people here. And I had questioned, and I think a lot of people questioned, why it took so long to get to take the guy out. To take the guy out. And today, a timeline, uh, the sheriff, I should say yesterday, the sheriff went through uh, the timeline. First, he talked a little bit about the other hotel that he was booked into that he might have considered doing a, uh, a shooting at. What we know is Stephen Paddock is a man who spent decades acquiring weapons and ammo and living a secret life, much of which would never be fully understood. He meticulously planned on the worst domestic attack in United States history. As many of you already reported, Paddock rented a room at the Ogden Hotel in downtown Las Vegas. This has been confirmed, okay? Reasons that ran through Paddock's mind is unknown, but it was directly during the same time as Life is Beautiful. That's we have received recovered um, evidence from that location we don't know if it is evidence, but we have recovered items um, and uh, video uh, evidence. And I don't want to, you know what, I'm using the wrong term. Evidence is not the term. We have recovered video from there to review uh, Mr. Paddock's actions. Okay, so they have a video. They don't have any uh, evidence out of a, a hotel room. But uh, he was there. There's there's three music festivals that he wanted to uh, have, have a rental above, and this uh, this was one of them unbelievably calculating it is it's stunning stunning right a little bit more coming up from the sheriff including the timeline and why it took so long to get to the shooter and i was a little upset about it but once i i learned about it like so many things once you digest everything it makes a lot of sense we we'll talk about uh, Fountain of Life Cairo.com in Kansas City. Fountain of Life Cairo, Dr. Alex Nelson is a terrific person. He runs a chiropractic uh, practice, and I'll tell you, chiropractic has helped me so much. Back to working out again. I've, I've had a rough few months, and I'm back to working out again, so I am stiff as a board. Chiropractic is great if you are uh, experiencing uh, uh, pain from, you know, st strain of muscles, from uh, compression of herniated discs. If you've got hip pain or knee pain or, or a carpal tunnel, all of these things can be relieved with chiropractic. Dr. Alex Nelson is on North Congress Avenue in Kansas City, and it's fountainoflifechiro.com, fountainoflifechiro.com. Glad to have them as a sponsor. A little bit more from uh, Sheriff Lombardo. This is the timeline of uh, what happened on Sunday night in Vegas. So at 10.05, the first shots fired by the suspect. This was seen on closed-circuit television from the concert venue. 1012, first two officers arrived on the 31st floor and announced that gunfire is coming from directly above them. Okay, so um, it took about seven minutes. Seven minutes for officers to arrive. They knew exactly where it was. 1015, the last shots were are fired from the suspect per body worn camera. And by the way, there was an unarmed security guard who went to the floor first. Okay, a story of this guy coming up, but he was a hero. He was there within minutes and then helped the police to clear out the other rooms. So if you're looking at the math, 10 minutes. Yep. 1017, the first two officers arrive on the 32nd floor. 1018, security officer tells the LVMPD officers he was shot and gives the exact location of the suspect's room. Now you notice a minute uh, delta there. Um, before they broadcasted it, obviously they were in a conversation with the security guard immediately upon them exiting the elevators. Um, between 1026 and 1030, eight additional officers arrived on the 32nd floor and began to move systematically down the hallway, clearing each room and looking for any injured people. This, they moved this way because no longer hear the gunfire of the active shooter situation. Okay, now, so the police were there. Within 20 minutes, they began clearing the rooms with the help of the security guard. 
The shooting, thank God, had already stopped. The shooting had already stopped. Now, I haven't heard yet uh, why it stopped, why he stopped shooting, why he didn't shoot for an hour and 20 minutes. I had heard uh, the possibility he might have just ran out of ammo, uh, which was uh, uh, a blessing, I guess. Here's a little bit more about uh, breaching the door and going into the suspect's room. 1055, eight officers arrive in the stairwell at the opposite end of the hallway nearest the suspect's room. So when I say nearest the suspect's room, you can imagine the doorway of the hotel room. This stairwell and this door access is approximately um, two to three feet away. 1120, the first breach was set off and officers entered the suspect's room. They observed the suspect down on the ground and also saw a second door that could not be accessed from their position. Okay, so they uh, they breached two doors or two entrances, two rooms in this suite. And uh, he had already killed himself. So uh, the this is a very complex operation that this guy had pulled off, gathering weapons, getting them to the room. Um, setting up a, a camera outside, uh, it was a, it was a uh, nursery camera so that you could see people coming down the hall. He had barricaded the stairwell outside of his room as well. So the only way to get up was through the elevator. The sheriff was asked if he, uh, thought he acted alone. I mean, you look at the, 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 the weapon obtaining, um, the different amounts of tannerite available, yeah. um, do you think this was all accomplished on his own self value? Um, face value you got to make the assumption there he had to have some help at some point and we want to ensure that that's the answer maybe he's a super guy maybe he uh superhero not a hero a super yeah, yeah. You know, i won't use the word um um maybe he's you know a super yahoo um that had was working out all this on his own um but it'd be hard for me to believe that okay uh yeah who knows who knows? Now, there are a lot of uh, rumors swirling around. I'm not going to speculate. I'll leave, leave that up to Alex Jones. Uh, talking about there might have been uh, bullets coming out of another place in the hotel. Somebody else was there. They were arranging a getaway car. He had uh, wired the money to his girlfriend uh, in the Philippines so he could go there and live with her. Um, the sheriff said that he did think that he, uh, that the, the suspect was, had planned on getting away. Had plenty of getting away. Now, back to the unarmed uh, security guard. Jesus Campos. He goes to the room almost immediately. He approaches the door and is immediately shot in the leg. He gets on his walkie-talkie and calls the police. That's when the police came up. This guy, despite being wounded, stayed with the police and cleared the floor. Here's the sheriff. So I don't know if he was armed, um, but his bravery um, was amazing because he remained with our officers, provided them the key pass to, to access the door and actually continued to help them clear rooms until our officer demanded that he go seek medical attention. Amazing. It, it is It is amazing. And there are hero stories after hero stories after hero stories with regard to uh, just people who, uh, who were injured, people who saved people, some who died, and I'm going to share a story. A name that I do want you to remember today a name that I want to remember today because a man lost his life at a very young age, left a family behind, and he deserves to be remembered. He deserves to be remembered. There was a young man, Jonathan Smith. Uh, he's still around. He's still alive. Jonathan Smith was uh, a lot of times, you know, you're thinking uh, the concert, it's all a bunch of white hicks and hay, you know, all that. Jonathan Smith, a young African-American man. He rushed toward the crowd and saved as many as 30 people until he was shot in the neck. And that's when a police officer, Tom McGrath, came to his rescue. They were on, I believe this is on uh, CNN, um, the officer on the phone, Jonathan, Jonathan Smith, talking about the incidents and, and tearing up. I want you to hear this exchange. Again, you, you, you could never tell who's going to be a hero, sometimes the most unlikely people. Uh, and I, I think not just myself. That's Jonathan Smith, buddy. But even Officer McGrath, um, who now I consider as a brother, um, to everyone else, 
that's this is what we should be doing. Um, it didn't matter what race I was. It didn't matter what race anybody was at that time. Um, all we've seen was a human a human life. Um, Isn't that nice to hear in a time where we're so racially divided? A young 20-something African-American man said, color doesn't matter. Just an amazing guy. I'll never forget that, that day or anybody else from that, for that matter. And Officer McGrath, you, as Jonathan said, you. Hmm. Jonathan is weeping at this time. You put your finger on that wound and you save this man's life. Yeah, I, Do you feel like he does? You are forever, as he said, a brother. Yeah, I, I, I consider him mine as well. You know, we, we, we said a lot of words yesterday when uh, I was able to, to get in contact with him. And, you know, I, I just remember all I, all I was telling him, was, you know, when we got that patrol vehicle and we're waiting for the paramedics, I was just telling him, you know, now now it's time to fight. I know, you know, he was feeling weak. I understand that, you know, it, it, it was a scary moment for both of us, but I just remember holding his hands with him. You know, this is the time to fight. You know, you made it this far. This is the time to fight. And he's a fighter. He's got that warrior mentality. He went He went into the sound of gunfire. He saved, you know, it could be more than 30 people. So if it's 30, then it's 30. You know, he had that warrior mentality. He went back in there. And, and would you, would you, this is so inspiring to me. This is this is so inspiring to me. It renews my faith in humanity. Unfortunately, on the left side of the political equation, you're not hearing tributes. You're hearing calls for gun control. You're hearing people like Nancy Sinatra saying that NRA members should be executed. You're hearing Michael Moore saying that the Second Amendment needs to be taken out of the Constitution. How about this? Let's celebrate those who are heroes in this country. Instead of pushing a political agenda that you hide year-round until something like this comes up. How about that, you big, fat turd Michael Moore? I had mentioned that the uh, killer's girlfriend, Marilu Danley, uh, came back. She's cooperating with authorities. I, I don't know how you don't notice all of these things when you move in with someone. She did earlier this year, but she did. Here's her uh, attorney uh, releasing a statement from her. I knew Stephen Paddock as a kind, caring, quiet man. I loved him and hoped for a quiet future together with him. He never said anything to me or took any action that I was aware of that I understood in any way to be a warning that something horrible like this was going to happen. A little more than two weeks ago, Stephen told me he found a cheap ticket and that he wanted me to take a trip home to see my family. While there, he wired me money, which he said was for me to buy a house for me and my family. I was grateful, but honestly, I was worried the unexpected trip home and then the money was a way of breaking up with me. It never occurred to me in any way whatsoever that he was planning violence against anyone. Anything I can do to help ease suffering and help in any way, I will do. You know, the thing about um, psychopaths, you never think they're psychopaths, okay? Uh, shh. This guy was able to, um, was able to uh, conduct himself a Ted Bundy, you never expected Ted Bundy to be who he was. Uh, you never expected, you know, a number of psychopaths. They, they're, they're generally charming people. This man's father was branded a psychopath. And you got to kind of wonder if these kind of things run in the family, you know, and I'm not, I'm not meaning to be light of it. You kind of wonder. That's a part of it. It is... Um, I'm sure that, uh, you know, when psychopaths are involved with people and they commit an act and they're discovered, the people around them are probably the last people who would have expected it. That's what I'm essentially saying. So, uh, anyway, that's, um, that's that. Uh, Martha McCallum 
featured a, a University of Georgia uh, instructor talking about uh, several things, talking about the girlfriend of the shooter and how uh, she believed that she was clueless in this. I think there's a big difference between uh, we have, for example, before Bataclan, Ahmed Koulibaly sent his wife slash live-in girlfriend away and she ended up in Islamic State. So we have a contrast with someone like Hayat Boumidjian, who was also sent away in the days before the attack. She didn't come back to cooperate with authorities. We also saw the Sarnayev, uh, the wife of uh, the Sarnayev Sarnayev. brothers, Catherine Russell. She wasn't cooperating with the Mm -hmm. FBI. So I think in this particular case, the fact that uh, Mary Lou came back, she's working with the FBI, I I think actually um, I'm inclined to believe her unless Mm -hmm. there's evidence otherwise. Okay. So there there is a major difference. the other terrorists obviously sent their, their wives away, and this guy sent this girlfriend away uh, so she wouldn't be harmed. Whatever. Uh, Mia Bloom also talked about uh, how he didn't believe, or she doesn't believe, that uh, the killer was a terrorist. You know, initially there were questions about the Philippines. There's uh, an ISIS group there. ISIS twice declared responsibility for this, which which I think was fairly unusual given their history, right? More yeah. than twice, yeah. They, they they can't stop declaring responsibility, and it's kind of pathetic because you look at this the story of this individual's life, and you see that Stephen Paddock was a drinker. They've even tried to justify his drinking, but you know, as as my friend and colleague Paul Crookshank said, there's no just justification for turning the gun on yourself if you want to be a martyr yep. uh, you let the other people shoot you you don't shoot yourself okay so if you wanted to be a martyr that's obvious well how you become a martyr is you let somebody else kill you so there's that and i never thought the 64 year old white guys don't become isis terrorists it just it doesn't happen uh and here is one more cut from uh, maya bloom talking about how this is not an isis thing isis can declare all at once that it, it's it's theirs but it, it, they're really just full of crap and we see them trying to take credit but the fact remains is that this is the wrong individual to be a soldier of the caliphate but also they've provided no evidence there's no last will and testament they keep saying it's coming it's coming yeah, sure. but the fact is that you know so if we if they hadn't made this bogus claim yeah. We wouldn't be talking about ISIS at all. And it's this uh, equivalent of what they call in psychology, the fear of missing out. They want to be part of the conversation. Yeah. And if they repeat it enough, they think that they will get some credit. And we see in some areas, Breitbart or Infowars, some of the conspiracy theorists, yes. they want to believe that it's ISIS. Yeah, they do. And, and, you know, and I understand why, because it would maybe make the unexplainable explainable it would maybe make some sense out of all of this so i understand that but i never believed that this was an isis terrorist thing never 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 i want to get to uh, the president's remarks yesterday he was uh, at the police department with uh, first responders sheriff's deputies and all and it was a beautiful thing it was a really beautiful uh, uh statement that he made michael moore in a lengthy facebook uh message said the uh, Second Amendment should be repealed and a new amendment would guarantee that states can have state militias, also state, uh, a.k.a. state national guards, which are made up of citizen soldiers who are called upon in times of natural disaster or other state emergencies. It would also allow individuals to use guns for sport and gathering food. What kind of gun, uh, gun are you going to use? It guarantees everyone the right to be free of and protected from gun violence, which never works, by the way. Uh, public safety comes ahead of an individual's right to own and fire a gun. He also said a well-regulated uh, state National Guard being helpful to the uh, safety and security of a state in times of need, along with a strictly regulated uh, a right of the people to keep and bear, uh, bear a limited number of non-automatic arms for uh, sport and hunting with respect to the primary right, right of all people to be free from gun violence. This shall not be infringed, which is just this pointless feel-good crap. Uh, there was a uh, Leah Lambresco used to write for uh, uh, Nate Silver's 538. It's a uh, pretty left-of-center publication, I guess. And she decided to look at uh, gun control, studied uh, all of the 33,000 gun homicides in the United States annually. Her takeaway on the efficacy of mainstream gun control policies is that they're appealing to the people who support them, mainly to the extent they make gun aficionados cry. 
because uh, uh, the left hates gun owners and they hate people who embrace the uh, uh, the Second Amendment. They hate people who are in the NRA and they hate the NRA and they're calling the NRA a terrorist organization, which is just unbelievable. She quoted, uh, I researched the strictly tightened gun laws in Britain and Australia and concluded they did not prove much about what America's policy should be. Neither nation experienced drops in mass shootings or other gun-related crime that could be attributed to their buybacks and bans. Mass shootings were too rare in Australia for their absence to, for after the gun-back program to be clear evidence of progress. And in both Austria, Australia and Britain, the gun restrictions had an ambiguous effect on other gun-related crimes or deaths. Uh, when I looked at the other oft-praised uh, policies, I found that no gun owner walks into a store to buy an assault weapon. It's an invented classification that includes any semi-automatic that has two or more features, such as a bayonet mount, a rocket-propelled grenade launcher mount, a folding stock, or a pistol grip. But guns are modular, and any hobbyist can easily add these features at home, just as if they were snapping together Legos. So assault weapon is a, uh, a made-up term. Two-thirds of gun deaths in the United States are suicides. Almost no proposed restriction would make it meaningfully hard, harder for people with guns on hand to use them. I couldn't even answer my most desperate question if I had a friend who had guns in his home and a history of suicide attempts. Was there anything I could do that would help? A horrendous... Uh, as horrendous as mass shootings are, by far the most terrible threat posed by guns is that them, uh, they're suicide machines. Someone who's inclined to kill himself with a firearm handy may well try and fail, or without, I should say, a firearm handy, will uh, uh, try and fail. Taking too small a dose of pills or not slicing their wrist deep enough, a gunshot rarely fails. Her advice. Well, she says of uh, Democrat anti-gun hobby horses, they often seem as if they are drafted by people who have encountered guns only as a figure in a briefing book or an image on the news, which is true. I've got a montage of clueless uh, people on MSNBC and NBC talking about guns, and they, 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 they're stupid. <laughs> they, they have no idea. Her advice, instead of focusing on feel-good policies that won't do much of anything to regain or reduce gun violence or on massively heavy-handed policies like confiscation, which have zero chance of passing, instead consider policies that will address the social pathologies that drive the three most common forms of gun violence, suicide, gun violence, and domestic violence. That's what she says. That's what she says. Okay. Let's uh, let's hear some stuff from the president here yesterday. The president uh, first acknowledged someone, and I want you to remember this name. As you go through your life, as you move into the holiday season and celebrate being with your family or even just enjoy your child walking through the door after school tonight. Remember Charleston Hartfield an off-duty Las Vegas police officer, recently published a book uh, about his life on the force, was killed Sunday. 34-year-old military veteran Charles Chucky, or Chucky Hart, he also coached youth football. His buddy, uh, Troy Brett, Troy Rett said, uh, he kept texting him Sunday night, hoping he'd text back, and he never got it. He said, I figured he was probably busy helping others. I don't know a better man than Charles. They say it always it's always the good ones. We lose early. There's no truer statement than that with Charles. Our hearts have been heavy since hearing the news. Charles, an African-American as well. Not saying that means anything. I'm just saying, if you think it was all just a bunch of white people rescuing white people, it wasn't. He wrote a, uh, a book called The Memoirs of a Public Servant. And so you might consider ordering that on Amazon to help out his family. 16 years of active military service, 11 years of law enforcement. He spent his life serving, and he died serving. Here's the president talking about him. Here at the police department, we remember one of our own who died this week, Charles Hartfeld. He was a very, very special person. Officer Hartfeld was a proud veteran a devoted husband, a loving father. His death is a tragic loss for this police force, for the city, and for our great nation. We struggle for the words to explain to our children how such evil can exist, how there can be such cruelty and such suffering. 
but we cannot be defined by the evil that threatens us Amen. or the violence that incites such terror. We're defined by our love, our caring, and our courage. Okay. Charles Hartfield, remember that name. Here the president is talking about uh, several police officers who uh, were as heroic as any as anyone who has ever been in battle. Here on earth, we are blessed to be surrounded by heroes. As one eyewitness recounted this week, while everyone else was crouching, police officers were standing up as targets, just trying to direct people and tell them where to go. The officers were standing up in the line of fire to help those in danger and to find out where those horrible shots were coming from. Words cannot describe the bravery that the whole world witnessed on Sunday night. Americans defied death and hatred with love and with courage. And they did. And they did. It, it, that's the most extraordinary thing. That's just the most extraordinary thing. I can't, I, I guess it's hard for me to grasp. It's hard for me to grasp. I don't know how I'd react. Who knows? Who knows what you have inside of you until that moment? Here's the president talking about three particular officers. Metropolitan police officers Tyler Peterson and Tanner Gurley and civilian Aaron Stalker. Officer Peterson was on his second day on the job when the shooting began. I just visited him in the hospital. Within minutes, he joined a group of officers rushing between flying bullets to clear the fairground and save lives. Officer Gurley was off duty attending the concert. Although she was unarmed, as soon as the shooting began, she threw on a yellow police vest and began evacuating victims. Now think about that. She made herself a target. She, she didn't only just help people out. She put on a yellow police vest and made herself a target. And the police were targeted by the shooter. And Aaron Stalker, a veteran, rushed to the scene to search for his loved ones. But when he couldn't find them, he began helping every person he could. As he recounts, we used the plastic barriers as gurneys to carry the injured to transportation. I made splints out of whatever I could find and used anything to stop the horrible bleeding. Unreal. Really, really unreal. But, you know, by gosh, uh, change the, and, and get rid of the Second Amendment, uh, ban silencers, whatever. So tired of the noise. This is so tired of the noise. I want to focus on the, on the, just the, the bravery. Thomas Gunderson first heard the noise thought a speaker had malfunctioned. Maybe somebody had shot off some fireworks. Then he heard screams, and then the 28-year-old from Newport Beach, California, realized he was standing in the middle of a killing field. Thomas Gunderson heard the first gunshots, jumped into action, helping people to safety outside the Mandalay Bay Resort and Casino. In the early moments of the Las Vegas massacre, Thomas joined the other concert goers to evacuate people to safety. He says there were a lot of people helping and risking their lives for others. In the midst of the chaos and the carnage, Thomas kept wondering if what was happening was really happening. A split second later, a bullet plunged into his leg. I went straight to the ground. It didn't hurt. My body numbed up. I was covered in a pool of blood. It was shooting out. It was literally everywhere. He dragged himself behind a row of bleachers. I was getting scared at this point. I thought I might bleed out. In a matter of two minutes, two young women came upon Thomas and administrated life-saving first aid. One of the women wrapped a belt around his leg while the other got men to carry him to safety. Thomas considers himself lucky. The bullet went through and through. He suffered torn muscles in his calf and nerve pain, but the bullet missed bone and arteries. Said it's hard to stand, very painful. And that's what makes what he did at the hospital yesterday remarkable because he heard the president was coming to visit him and he said, I am going to stand out of respect for the office of the presidency. He said it was one of the biggest moments of my life. 
even though in se severe pain, he was determined to stand and greet the president. He said, I told my family that I was going to stand and shake my president's hand out of respect for him and our leaders and our nation. And that's what he did. Grimacing in pain as he greeted the president, shook his hand. If you haven't seen the video, I posted it on Facebook. Rob Carson Show. It's on Twitter at Rob Carson. It's all over. You've seen it. This is his writing. He says, that was one of the most uh, humbling experiences of my life. The fact that the president would take time to come here, shake my hand, and to let us know if I needed anything. It was deeply a heartfelt moment between a patriotic American citizen and his president. It was a general reminder that we are a united people, one nation under God. God bless you, Thomas Gunderson. God bless you, Thomas Gunderson. God bless you, man. I have a little montage. I'm not going to play the whole thing. A montage of MSNBC and NBC talking about uh, silencers or suppressors, talking about uh, all sorts of stupid stuff. I'll just play a little bit of it because I don't want to focus on the stupid, but I do have to acknowledge the stupid here. They were preparing to loosen gun regulations to allow people to use these silencers to make them more available. Would, no, they weren't actually. As you because can, the imagine, Congress wasn't. Just, their ears were hurting. Because the imagine hunters, their ears how much were hurting. Worse. That would everything he needed to acquire what he needed to make these weapons automatic legally. It, it was debatable whether it was fireworks to begin with. How many more people would have died if he had silencers on these weapons? You still would have heard it. It's as loud as a jackhammer. But James, uh, we're talking about this bump stock for several different reasons. One is just the absurdity of the existence of something that's legal uh, to buy, but illegal to use. Now, that's Chris Cuomo, and he said that a numerous times this week. It's, it's legal to buy, but illegal to use. He's wrong. It's legal to buy, and it's legal to use. Uh, it would, there would be no point in, in legalizing its sale if it can't be used. Okay. It's like, uh, okay, we're going to legalize the sale of hammers, but if you hammer a nail, that's illegal. Uh, that's just dumb. <laughs> okay. That's just, that's just dumb. Uh, as far as these, these, uh, bumpers, I don't care. You know, I, I don't care. There are a number of ways you can make a weapon automatic. Well, where there's a will, there's a way. You can make, I saw a video this morning, it went viral. A guy actually uh, took a, uh, I think it was an M4, and he technically made it able to shoot 17,000 rounds in a minute. You can, you can technically do it. He showed you how to do it. There are a million ways you can do it. It's not just the stock. It's just this is what the, this, this guy had, okay? This guy on the, the viral video also, uh, he showed you how he could make a pistol be able to shoot 2,000 rounds a minute. You can't feed a pistol that many bullets, but you could technically do it. There's a million ways. There's a million. I'm just going to throw this one away. Story about MSCNBC. Uh, you know, it, these events bring the best and the worst out of people. You heard about the uh, uh, Vermont newspaper, the Bennington Banner. And they put a cartoon on, I think this was this Tuesday. It had a pile of cartoon bodies, and it says, whatever happens in Vegas. Well, now they are, uh, they're, they're under a lot of heat, and they should, because it was an, honestly, it was a, it was a Charl Charlie Hebdo moment. President of the New, New England's newspapers offered an apology. He said, dear reader, on Tuesday, the banner published a cartoon that many people, including me, found to be insulting and bad taste. We regret and apologize for the cartoon. It was made in haste. We are addressing the matter, inter in matter internally. The gravity of our error in judgment was magnified by the fact one of the victims of the unspeakable horror was from uh, Dorset, which is, I guess, near there. As the president of the company, I apologize to the entire Bennington community that the banner was so insensitive. Just a, I mean, I don't know who thinks like this. Who thinks like this? And if it, if it were a bunch of uh, 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 liberal concert goers at... Um, Lilith Fair. Sorry, the fan's making some noise. If it were Lilith Fair, would I would I care any less? No. Would I immediately jump to the Second Amendment? No. Would I immediately do a cartoon about it? No. Would I immediately tweet uh, something insensitive and awful about it? No. Would I suggest that uh, members of whatever group all need to be assassinated? No. It's it's just honestly it's just it's awful. It brings out the best and the worst. There was an owner of a Chicago Deli, and uh, immediately after he owns Max's Deli in Chicago's Highland Park, jumped to his Twitter account Monday morning at seven, 
and basically hinted that he was happy the shooting wasn't an incident of racism, was glad it was white people shooting at white people. As soon as I heard it was country music, I felt relief. White people shooting white people isn't horror, it's community outreach. He has said since that it was a dumb joke. It was 7 in the morning. I was stressed out and freaked out by the shooting. It was a dumb joke. didn't work out. I own it. It was stupid. I own the words I wrote. They hurt people. I apologize. You're a doofus. You are a doofus, sir. You are a doofus. Again, I don't know. Things like that. But, you know, it's okay to be racist against um, white people. It's okay to make fun of country music goers. It's okay to stereotype them. And they, and they do stereotype them. And there were a lot of stereotypes. There were a lot of stereotypes about the, the, the concert goers. Um, one of the positives was they're patriotic and they're brave. And they're uh, supporters of the military and frequently members of the military. Those things are the positive stereotypes. The rest is their hit hicks, their rednecks, their they hate uh, brown people and all that. Well, that's none of that's true. Although, then wrong with being a redneck. Most of my family are rednecks. <laughs> Thank you very much. Let's move on to other stuff, shall we? Cam Newton. Cam Newton, Car Carolina Panthers made a sexist statement. Uh, he was at a press conference and a, a female um, member of the media. Started to, uh, Jordan Rodriguez is her name, and uh, she works for the Charlotte Observer, and she's well, you know, well versed. And, and listen, I, I don't even think twice when I see a female sports reporter. Uh, Lindsay Zarniak, I knew her, got to know her in Washington D.C. Uh, it doesn't matter to me, but anyway, I guess Cam kind of thought it was funny. I know you take a, a lot of pride in seeing your receivers play well. Devin Funches has seemed to really embrace the physicality of his routes and and making getting those extra yards. Does that give you? A little bit of an enjoyment to see him kind of truck sticking people out there. It's funny to hear a female talk about routes. Like, it's funny. Okay, so he's uh, taking all sorts of heat about it. First of all, you know, shut up. Uh, everybody's offended. I mean, come on. Reading a, a comment by David Hookstead, and he said, the guy has to listen to his alpha male coaches talk about routes, breaks, anticipation reads on the leading uh, receiver every day of his season he then gets asked a very reasonable question by somebody he's not used to discussing the topic with it's not because he's sexist he's not used to hearing it it'd be uh, similar to if one day my mother came home started talking about duck blinds and deer stands that's uh, david hookstead no big deal can we just stop being offended about everything <laughs> can we can we just stop being offended by everything kind of i think i think it's a non-story i think it's not whatever Good news for uh, soldiers in the field. Uh, Defense Secretary James Defense yeah, Secretary James Mattis changed the rules of engagement in Afghanistan. In effect, unleashing troops to fire on the Taliban without first having to be in physical contact. U.S. forces during the uh, Obama administration have been pro prohibited from striking the Taliban since 2014 unless Taliban fighters directly threat U.S. or allied forces, forces or in the event that the Afghanistan government is about to lose the city. So you've got to be under fire before you can fire. You can't go get them and prevent it from happening. This created a complicated legal and political situation which frustrated troops on the ground. But the Trump administration's new Afghanistan strategy has prompted Mattis to have a much wider latitude to troops, and now they can start kicking ass and taking names. And I have a feeling a lot of those names are Muhammad. Yeah. Probably a lot of those names are Muhammad. I'm just saying. Oh, Lord in heaven. Government bureaucrats, sometimes, uh, uh, I don't know. You you know what I'm saying. And not all of them, not all of them. I'm not saying every government bureaucrat is, a, is an idiot. I, uh. U.S. Food and Drug Administration Tuesday released a warning letter to uh, the Neshoba Brook Bakery reprimanding the West Concord, Massachusetts baker and wholesaler about the ingredients on its list of granola. Uh, one of the ingredients they list is love. Quote from the uh, the FDA, your Neshoba granola label lists ingredient love. Love is not a common or usual name of an ingredient and is considered to be intervening material because it is not part of the common or usual name of the ingredient. Okay. <laughs> 
chief executive of the company, John Gates, says, I really like that we list love on the granola. People ask us uh, what makes it good. It's kind of nice that this artisan bakery can say there's love in it and put a smile on people's face. Situations like uh, that where the government is telling you you can't list love as an ingredient because it might be deceptive just feels so silly. Who was who 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 so separated from their humanity at the FDA that they, they would go after a bakery for saying, we put a little love in our granola. I just... Wow, 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 wow. Oh, they found Santa Claus's tomb. St. Nicholas's tomb, apparently, uh, under a church in Dimri, southern Turkey. Uh, they believe the shrine has not been damaged at all and uh, and the body is intact. But, uh, yeah, you might not want to uh, share this with the kids if they're little. Oh, this is kind of funny. A guy, um, Marine veteran, owns a, a Beefo Brady's restaurant. And a lot of people go to watch uh, football games there. And he decided, he said that uh, he disagrees with the NFL anthem protests. Says, I have to tell you, as a veteran of the United States Marines, I served to defend our country's constitution, free speech. And while I defend the right of every American to express their views and voices freely, the actions demonstrated by the NFL players during the country's national anthem it was offensive and disrespectful to me as a proud veteran. So he canceled his direct TV. Uh, DirecTV is giving re- refunds to normal, you know, to, to people in their their home packages, but not with uh, restaurants. And it was six thousand dollars, so we had to eat the fee. Um, and because of this, his sales have gone up two to three hundred percent. Says people have uh, never seen, we've never seen before, are driving hours to support us, and the employees we have are received heartwarming and supportive phone calls. So worked out well for them, huh? I don't think it'll help if you have a crummy restaurant, if you have a bad restaurant. I wouldn't, I wouldn't count on it. I just I wouldn't count on it. Um, oh, oh, uh, least and most tax-friendly states in the country. I moved two years ago from the least tax-friendly state. Now, this is, a, you know, depending on uh, where you state income taxes, property taxes cost thousands of dollars a year. Kiplinger does this tax map, and they sent this this morning. I thank Kiplinger for sending me this, kiplinger.com. Uh, The most friendly tax states uh, from 10 to 1, Mississippi, Louisiana, Arizona, Delaware. Delaware is a nice state. Uh, It's like uh, it's like uh, cornfields meet the ocean. North Dakota, Nevada, Nevada. In Nevada, in in Las Vegas, you call it Nevada. That's it. Florida, of course. South Dakota, where my mom lives. Alaska and Wyoming. Wyoming, number one on the list. Least, least, least. And you'll notice something very similar about all of these uh, these states. They're all run by uh, Democrats. New Jersey. Well, except, you know, Chris Christie. He might as well be one. Uh, New Jersey, Connecticut, California, Hawaii, number seven. Vermont, six. Maine, five. Illinois, which is a friggin' mess. It's the That is the state with the highest number of people leaving to live somewhere else. New York, number three, of course. Uh, Number two is Minnesota. I used to live there. Number one is Maryland. That's where I moved from. That's where I moved from. All right, I'm going to play a little bit from The Tonight Show last night. If you you, uh, have eaten eaten something viscous, um, you might want to put it down because this could kind of make you uh, throw up in your mouth a little bit. This is Miley Cyrus reading a thank you note. Thank you, Hillary for always sticking to the issues, even as people criticized you for superficial things like your hair, your wardrobe, and your appearance. You showed girls everywhere that politics isn't a popularity contest, because if it were, you would have won by about three million votes. No, actually, um, it is a popularity contest, and she does not that popular. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you, Hillary Clinton. For being someone I continue to admire Some of his writers. and look up to. And for standing up to critics who said that a woman couldn't be president because they'd be too emotional, impulsive, and unpredictable. Who said that? Who, who said who said who the frick said that? I don't know any I never heard that. Who said that? She's making this up. <laughs> so glad we didn't end up with someone like that. <laughs> 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 Thank you, thank you, Hillary, for being a constant beacon of strength. That's Miley. Hope 
and determination for me and millions of other young women. Oh, boy. You've been a role model and good, inspiration good 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 and a voice of reason in Boop. uncertain times. Boop. I could go on and on, but I'd like to get right to the point. Yes. Can I give you a hug? Yes! What the, what what happened to late night television? What 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 happened to late night television? Dear God in heaven, uh, unbelievable! Oh, this is kind of funny. I've got an Amazon Alexa. Do you have one? If you have an Amazon Alexa, just say Alexa, play the Rob Carson Show podcast. It will play the latest episode, which is uh, this one, episode number one eighty one. Okay, so you should know that. Um, the lyrics people request most from Amazon Alexa. Uh, like if you say to Alexa, um, play the song that goes whatever. The number one song is this by Fitz and the Tantrums. Cause you don't even know. I can make your hands clap. Say I can make your hands clap. So okay, so there you go. So people say, uh, okay, um, play the song that goes I can make your hands clap. And it's kind of funny. And then there are programs on your phone you can actually play a sample of the song and figure it out. Number two on the list is this oldie. Get your motor running. Head out on the highway. People say, Alexa, tell me about the song that says head on, head on the highway. That's what it is. All right. Uh, oh, oh, number, uh, another, well, number four actually on the list is uh, Wrecking Ball by Miley Cyrus. People say, uh, Alexa, play the song that says I came in like a wrecking ball. Is what. I Okay, that's that's cool. Um, oh, oh, I, I forgot number three. Justin Timberlake can't stop the feeling. Alexa, play the song that says, "I got this feeling in my bones." I got this feeling. Oh yeah. Inside my bones. I know this song. It goes electric, wavy when I turn it on. My daughter uh, loves that song. And then uh, number five on it is uh, uh, people say, uh, "Alexa, um, what is the song that has true love won't desert you?" Separate ways. Kind of fun. The personal assistant thing is, is is cool as hell. If you don't have one, consider getting one. Because I'll tell you what, they are um, really, really cool. Before I get to um, the last story of the day, which is this year's um, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductees, uh, I should say nominees, I want to mention Liberty One TV, which you're watching now, Liberty One TV, um, we're adding members. We're getting ready to add a very substantial name to the number of video podcasters here. Uh, for $10 a month, you can be a member. Uh, if you like this show, please become a member because it's going to help pay me. Annual subscription is uh, $99 a year. Producers Club is $1,000 a year. And uh, there are advantages to you, um, your name, business name, on all the videos as the show producer. All right. So that is LibertyOneTV.com. Also, uh, you can hear this show, and maybe you are listening to the show, at uh, 5 o'clock Central Standard Time on the Podcast Radio Network. It is a uh, international network with podcasts from all over the world. Mine just happens to run every day, 5 o'clock Central Standard Time. And I really consider myself uh, very fortunate to have that. So uh, thank you, Podcast Radio Network. Thank you, Liberty One TV. You guys, a kick ass. Oh, also thank you to my sponsor, uh, Dr. Alex Nelson. Fountain of Life Cairo.com. Fountain of Life Cairo.com. Oh, and before we go, you see this down here? This uh, tpublic.com, conservatives. That's my uh, uh, politically incorrect swag line. Uh, you can buy t shirts, you can buy hoodies, you can buy all sorts of stuff. There are 61 designs up there. Some, some very cool ones lately about standing up for the anthem. Uh, veganism is in, in, in eating disorder. You can't coexist when some want to kill you. Again, tpublic.com slash users slash conservatives. A lot of birthdays in October. Sometimes war is the answer, people. Is war is not always not the answer. Got your safe space right here. Suck it up, snowflake. Suck it up, snowflake. Again, for those on the audio, tpublic.com, tepublic.com slash user slash conservatives. Conservatives. Calm down. Uh, she lost. He won. Get over it. That includes you, uh, Tonight Show writers. Um, proud climate change denier. I don't know, there's a bunch of there's oh this is my one of my favorites um, murderous commie douchebag not a hero that is uh, Shea Guevara 
who's frequently considered a hero by the left in this country. So, uh, again, if you would order, man, it would be so cool because um, it's uh, my fledgling project working with a professional designer named uh, Sam Cangelosi, who is a genius. He is a genius, and he does the designs, and I come up with the ideas, and sometimes he comes up with the designs and the ideas, but we uh, collaborate on it, and it's pretty darn awesome. Okay. Uh, this year looks like um, 19 acts nominated for next year's Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Uh, they include uh, Radiohead, which I never, I never got. I never got Radiohead. I never understood them. I never particularly liked them. I thought uh, Pablo Honey was an okay record, but they were never as big as they were like Oasis. So they had a couple big hits in that. Day. Rage Against the Machine, kaboom! I love them. Bon Jovi, sure. Uh, Depeche Mode, yep. Yeah. Judas Priest, Hell's to the Yes. The Cars, yeah, why not? Dire Straits, LL Cool J, The Year the Rhythmics, The Moody Blues, also The Zombies. Eh, nah. No one told me about Jay Giles Band. Oh, yeah. Kate Bush, MC5, The Meters, don't know. Link Ray, no idea. Nina Simone, Sister Rosetta Tharp, and Rufus featuring Oshaka Khan. Oshaka Khan. All right, guys, I want to thank you very much for uh, watching today and listening today. Again, uh, LibertyOneTV.com. Become a member. We would appreciate it. And then, of course, the Podcast Radio Network also uh, download it free on my podcast, free on iTunes, iHeartRadio, Audio Boom, Tune In, Player FM, a host of other YouTube, YouTube, by the way. Uh, just look up Rob Carson Show Podcast. In the meantime, God bless you. Have a good one. And we'll see you back here uh, tomorrow. Thanks for listening to The Rob Carson Show. Friend him on Facebook at Carson Show, on Twitter at Rob Carson, and on Instagram. Uh, I think Facebook and Twitter are enough for now. We'll see you soon.